Welcome to the Jackson Kelly webinar, Clean Water Act Litigation Update. Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to address some administrative issues. Because we want to make sure we limit this presentation to no more than 60 minutes, questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. For those of you participating from your computer, questions may be submitted using the chat pane located at the bottom of your screen. If you have technical questions during the course of the webinar, you may use the chat pane or send an email to marketing at jacksonkelly.com. The full presentation will be sent to you via a web link. Included in this email will be a link to a voluntary survey. We will use your responses to this survey to plan future webinars and events. All participants' phones have been muted and the presentation is now being recorded. Thank you all for attending. Today's webinar is presented by Chris Hunter. Hello, thank you for that uh, introduction. My name is Chris Hunter and I'd like to thank everybody on the uh, well, phone or web, I guess, for joining us this afternoon for the uh, Clean Water Act litigation update. Uh, today we're going to be focusing primarily on two cases out of the Southern District of West Virginia, um, OVEC versus Marfork, and the second one is OVEC versus Elk Run. Um, I'm going to provide kind of a brief overview of the Clean Water Act uh, and uh, just so we understand how we got to where we are with these decisions. And uh, there's going to be some you know, background stuff on the Clean Water Act that will be really maybe a little bit too basic to uh, many of you uh, here, but uh, I thought it might be helpful to anybody who's not quite as familiar with environmental issues impacting the coal industry uh, as others. So uh, forgive me if I'm, uh, you know, talking about stuff that you've heard a million times and it's just too basic, but uh, just bear with me. So with that, let's begin. Um, We'll start with a little bit about, uh, just briefly about the history of the Clean Water Act, uh, just because I think it's relevant to the decisions we're going to be talking about, um, how we shifted from water quality based focus to more uh, into pipe effluent limits uh, focus. And this is just a little cartoon that I thought was sort of appropriate in uh, discussing kind of where we were prior to the 1972 Clean Water Act and the subsequent amendments and how we got to where we are today. So uh, prior to the enactment of the Clean Water Act in 1972, we had some other laws that were kind of viewed as not being terribly effective um, as far as controlling water pollution. And under the old regulatory scheme, uh, states came up with water quality standards for uh, bodies of water within their borders. Uh, you know, if you were operating uh, some sort of industrial operation, you could discharge pollutants so long as the discharges didn't reduce water quality below the standards that the state came up with. But the water quality scheme uh, was plagued with some problems. It was often difficult to come up with precise water quality standards, but even more so, it was difficult to, for the regulators to prove whose particular discharges were responsible for uh, reducing water quality uh, below the uh, standards that they had come up with. And I'm sure many of you have seen uh, this picture before, uh, but you had a, a regulatory scheme that, you know, is not viewed as effective. And uh, this is a picture of the 1969 uh, river in Cleveland, Ohio on fire, and it's kind of widely cited and widely used uh, to explain kind of the spark to the passage of the modern Clean Water Act. And, uh, you know, I'm not uh, from Cleveland or not from that era, but uh, Apparently, it was, used to be kind of a thing for the uh, river to catch on fire. Uh, you know, it used to be a regular occurrence, and I was reminded a few weeks ago, uh, the headline in the Daily Mail, uh, there you see, Milton Flea Market catches fire again, and uh, I just thought the again there was kind of funny because uh, uh, maybe that's a regular occurrence too, and if you shop at the Milton Flea Market, I would suggest that you find a new place to shop, and I need like a sound effect rim shot or something, because I'm not live here to sort of signal when I'm making a joke. But uh, so anyway, the, the Clean Water Act, it represents a fundamental change in the manner uh, that we regulate pollution. It, it shifted the focus away from just the water quality standards um, to the discharge, the direct limitations placed on the discharge of pollutants. So the regulators no longer have to determine whether there's a causal link between you know, the, the degradation of the water quality and a particular pollutant in a particular discharge, all they got to do is 
you know, look at whether the entity is discharging more pollution than, or more, pollu more of a pollutant uh, than is allowed by uh, their Clean Water Act permit. And so in case you can't read the caption, uh, this guy says, so that's where it goes. Uh, I'd like to thank you fellows for bringing that to my attention. And, and nowadays, if, if you're discharging, if you're channeling and conveying water and you've got a point source, you know exactly where it's going and you know it's in your discharge, or well, at least hopefully you should. So uh, the CWA, uh, or Clean Water Act, sorry, it, it prohibits discharge uh, except in compliance with a permit, and it creates the uh, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. I'm going to shorten that to NPDES. In environmental law, we use a lot of acronyms, um, and that can be annoying to some people, uh, but it, it can be a mouthful if you say everything, so we'll, we'll shorten that to NPDES. But it establishes the NPDES permitting system for the discharge of pollutants from point sources. And so, you know, states still adopt water quality standards, and in West Virginia, that's the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection. And the water quality standards, they define the goals for a water body uh, by designating uses and setting criteria to protect those uses. And then they establish provisions for protecting the water quality standards. And so the water quality standards, they, you know, they establish conditions that must be uh, maintained to protect the uses, and, and examples of uses are public water supply, uh, human recreation, aquatic life support. But again, um, the water quality standards are sort of the goals, but they're implemented under the modern Clean Water Act by the end of pipe affluent limitations. And in talking about uh, the water quality standards, we, we have two, but they, we separate them into two basic categories. You have numeric standards and narrative standards. Um, we're going to talk about two cases, uh, one uh, illustrating uh, enforcement of the numeric standard and one of the narrative standard. Uh, the first one is going to be the numeric standard. And, and the numeric standard, it consists of allowable concentration of particular pollutants. And there are three components that you see listed here. Uh, you got magnitude, duration, and frequency. Now, everybody's familiar with magnitude. Uh, that's simply the limits placed on the concentration of the pollutant. Uh, duration deals with the length of time during which the average concentration uh, or the average concentration may not exceed the given concentration. And I've got the bug zapper pictured here because I think that kind of illustrates the concept behind requiring a duration component. Um, DEP recognizes that at lower concentrations for certain pollutants, you know, aquatic life, uh, a fish isn't just going to run into an area uh, with a lower level of pollutant and just explode, you know. Uh, but, you know, at lower levels, uh, you know, above a certain level, uh, certain pollutants can be harmful over a longer exposure period. The frequency element um, isn't really relevant to the decisions today, but that's just the uh, number of instances in a given time period during which you can exceed the water quality standards, so we won't spend much time on that. But since we're going to be talking about uh, OVEC versus MAR for the first case today, uh, that's a selenium case. And many of you are going to be familiar with selenium issues. But uh, the magnitude portion of West Virginia's water quality standards for uh, selenium uh, for the protection of aquatic life, there's an acute limit. And that's more like the bug zapper limit. Uh, that's uh, if the fish uh, sits in uh, water with a concentration of 20 parts per billion for about an hour, uh, that's kind of the bug zapper. They think, uh, DEP thinks that's going to cause a problem. Now, the chronic limitation is set at five parts per billion. And uh, the duration component for the chronic standard is four days. So you can't exceed five parts per billion over a four-day period. And uh, we'll just talk briefly because what we dealt with uh, in MAR fork is water quality based uh, water quality based effluent limits, and you know the, the NPDES permits uh, that you get to discharge, uh, they they set uh, a lot of times they set what's known as technology based limits, and those are kind of the minimum uh, limits that dischargers have to meet, uh, assuming you know an unlimited assimilation capacity in a receiving stream. Uh, it's kind of what's the minimum using the best available best practicable technology that you can meet. But in the coal industry, uh, a lot of time, you know, you're receiving 
the streams are sort of low in proportion to the discharge, or the, the waters might already contain high levels of pollutants. And, you know, and, and when mining, you can't really choose the location where you perform your mining. You kind of have to go where the business is. You can't just decide, you know, I'm only going to mine near large rivers. So you frequently uh, discharge into low flow streams. And so you, you end up in a situation oftentimes with, if you have rugged or steep terrain, uh, a lot of times the only available space for a treatment pond is in the stream itself. And so you got an in-stream pond, which is both the discharge and the stream. Um, so you end up with what's known as a water quality-based affluent limitation, um, which is more stringent than a technology-based affluent limitation. Uh, because you have to be meeting water quality standards at the end of your uh, pipe, so to speak, discharge. And down at the bottom there, I just have an incredibly crude illustration. Uh, again, for those maybe not as familiar with uh, surface mining, you've got two mountains. You've got a valley down in between the mountains. You have a stream there in blue. And uh, so, you know, you construct your valley fill. Uh, you have your uh, center grain going down. And in order to catch the... Uh, drainage coming off the fill, uh, you have to construct a sediment pond, and, uh, which allows the uh, sediment to precipitate out uh, of the uh, drainage coming off the fill, so you don't increase the uh, solids and sediment in the stream too much. So due to the steepness of the terrain, though, a uh, sediment pond is not going to be effective if you put it directly to toe of the fill, so it has to be in stream. And so you see uh, you're, you're now channeling the stream and, you know, what comes out the end of that sediment pond is considered to be a discharge. And so since it is basically the discharge is the stream, you've got to meet water quality based affluent limits. And so that's kind of the, the background statutory scheme uh, overview to, to allow us to get into the permit shield. And the permit shield is central, uh, uh, provision of the Clean Water Act is kind of central to the cases we're going to be discussing today. And basically, uh, and we have Captain America here um, because the coal industry, we're the good guys, we're the, we're the heroes of this story. Um, and we have the permit shield. And basically, Section 402K of the Clean Water Act, uh, it shields permittees from enforcement action, including citizen suits, if they are in compliance with their permit. And so when your NPDF permit uh, that you apply for and get from DEP in effect, you're, you're supposed to be shielded. And even if you don't necessarily have an express limit for a particular pollutant, courts have consistently held that the permit shield uh, protects permittees from claims that they violated the Clean Water Act because of discharges that, are, that aren't expressly identified and limited within the permit. And that's known as the uh, reasonable contemplation rule. And the reasonable contemplation rule basically applies to the permit shield. It applies to permit shield where you comply with the applicable reporting and disclosure requirements and where the discharges at issue are within the reasonable contemplation of the permitting authority. And again, going back to you know the modern focus of the Clean Water Act being on uh, in the pipe affluent limitations, uh, the reason for this is that uh, it kind of shifts the burden to the regulatory authority to understand your industry to ask you uh, for sampling and analysis of your discharges, to take a look at that, uh, and, and then for them to decide what kind of limits you need in your NPDES permit. And so, you know, you, if you comply with all the reporting and disclosure requirements, you should have the security of knowing as long as you're in compliance with your NPDES permit that the regulatory authority came up with and the limits therein, that you're going to be okay. And so now we're going to get into uh, the specifics of the first case uh, discussing the numeric standards. It's OVEC versus Marfork. And, and this is the case that dealt with enforcement of numeric limits in the form of the chronic water quality standard for selenium. Uh, the outlet at issue was a spillway from Marfork's Brushy Fork impoundment down in Raleigh County. And this is just another image uh, providing an overview of the impoundment. Uh, the Brushy Fork impoundment flows into Brushy Fork, uh, which flows into Marsh, uh, Little Marsh Fork, Marsh Fork, and then ultimately the Coal River. Um, now, this is the NPDES permit in question. 
Uh, so Mark Fork has an NPDES permit for Albedo 01, which is the uh, spillway that flows into Brushy Fork. Okay, now we move to Section A. This is part of the NPDES permit. And so OVEC filed this case as a Clean Water Act citizen suit uh, filed pursuant to 33 U.S.C. 1365 uh, that allows citizens to bring actions uh, against NPDES permit holders alleging violations of the Clean Water Act. But they filed this case alleging a violation of Mark Fork's permit limits or permit, you know, related to selenium discharges. So we go to Section A, and if you scan the affluent limitations here, you notice uh, right off the bat that there's no limit for selenium. These are the affluent limitations. You got limitations for pH, suspended solids, settable solids, iron, manganese, aluminum, total and aluminum dissolved. And you don't see selenium in there. And so now recall uh, the reasonable contemplation rule uh, for the CWA permit shield that we just talked about. When Marfork applied for uh, the reissuance, DEP, and if you apply for a permit, NPDES permit or a reissuance, DEP is going to require you to submit sampling for about 15 different metals. And you see up at the top here, this is uh, what's known as the Table 24C Metals Analysis. And so they can look at what's in your discharge and they can then decide uh, what are going to be the appropriate limits in your NPDES permit. And if you see here, um, Markwork complied with those disclosure requirements. Uh, we disclosed that we had some selenium in our discharge. And so DEP looked at that and they said, okay, the uh, water quality standard for selenium is five parts per billion uh, or uh, micrograms per liter is how it's expressed here. And we see that your discharge uh, is probably going to contain, you know, or we at least know that it's got two. So we know that it's got some selenium in it. But based on what we know about your operation, about the analysis, and, you know, sort of the strata you're going to be in, we don't think that you need selenium limits. You know, so the burden has shifted to DEP to impose the appropriate limits because we've done our part. And so pursuant to the reasonable contemplation rule, even if they choose not to impose limits for selenium, Mark work should be shielded from enforcement action regarding selenium because it, it falls within that reasonable contemplation rule. So... Um, OVEC says, essentially, all right, that's all well and good, but we're not alleging that you're violating the end-of-pipe affluent limits per se. You're violating West Virginia's water quality standards. Okay, and so we respond by saying, look, there's a long line of cases saying you, you cannot enforce water quality standards directly. Citizens simply cannot do it. And uh, here's, I think, a, a good quote uh, from the Eastern District of Kentucky uh, as recently as 2012, that gets at, again, kind of the, the difference between the modern Clean Water Act and sort of the old regulatory regime, that water quality standards lose their importance, uh, at least for a case against a discharger, once an NPDES permit is issued. Once the NPDES permit is, is issued, those water quality standards sort of drop out, and we look at the affluent limits that are imposed pursuant to the NPDES permit. That's how you enforce the Clean Water Act against an NPDES permit holder. Well, OVEC says, okay, we're not trying to enforce the water quality standards directly. We're not just saying, hey, there are these water quality standards out here. We want to enforce those. In fact, OVEC says, compliance with the water quality standards is actually a condition of your NPDES permit, and we can enforce any condition of your NPDES permit. Okay, so you look at Section C of uh, every coal NPDES permit, and you will find this boilerplate language that incorporates, by reference, Section 5.1 of the West Virginia Coal and PDS regs. And there I've got it circled. It's Section C, says 5.1, duty to comply. And this is something that I think, you know, people have known about for a while, kind of be an issue, but something that uh, until, you know, recently, uh, maybe over the last five so years, um, wasn't something a lot of people paid attention to. And uh, what we have in West Virginia is kind of a weird scheme. West Virginia has NPDES regs for both coal facilities and non-coal facilities. And these regs for both the coal and non-coal facilities are virtually identical, uh, and they both contain the permit shield provision. 
Okay. Um, but the coal regs have historically contained a separate provision that's not in the non-coal regs. And that provision is Section 5.1F. And that says that when you look at 5.1F, it, it requires that discharge is made pursuant to all coal and PDS, NPDES permits uh, shall not cause a violation of the water quality standards. Okay. So this is what OPEC says is kind of its shield-busting tool, that even though we are fully in compliance with the uh, in-the-pipe affluent limitations contained in the NPDES permit the EP issued us, well, as a condition of this permit, we go back to the duty to comply there. Uh, you know, that's a condition as well. That the affluent limitations are mere conditions that they can enforce, but this Section 5.1 is incorporated as a condition as well. So that means they can enforce, according to OPEC, every single water quality standard contained in West Virginia's water quality standard rules. So now we get into how do you go about enforcing a water quality standard. Remember, water quality standards, they're not designed for enforcement. They're the targets. They're the goals. The, influ the affluent limitations imposed in the NPDES permits are the means by which water quality standards are to be achieved. So as we discussed earlier, uh, the chronic standard, the numeric standard for selenium is expressed as a four-day average. Now, for, for discharge monitoring reports, DMR sampling, uh, you typically sample about twice a month and you submit those results quarterly. So you don't have, uh, for the most part, four-day averages. So you can't take a look at the DMRs, or plaintiffs can't take a look, and say, well, you've got uh, selenium over a five here, so you know that's a violation of the chronic standard. No, the chronic standard, remember, is has a duration component that's expressed as a four-day average. So here we've got a, a picture of the brushy fork compoundment spillway. Now, and I've got an arrow pointing there to the spillway. In uh, a typical Clean Water Act enforcement case. The plaintiffs would go out, the environmentalists would go out, and they'd take a jar and they'd collect a sample from the water uh, with the arrow there flowing over the edge of the spillway, the effluent. But here, it's clear from the NPDES permit that we don't have limits on our effluent. There's no selenium limits for what we're discharging into the stream. And this next slide, uh, I think that's probably a little small to text, but um, it delineates there. You got the arrow there at the Brushy Fork Impoundment Spillway, and this is kind of an it was an interesting case because the length of Brushy Fork, the entire length there, you see uh, with the, the other black line, it's only 28 feet. And uh, plaintiffs actually had to go out twice to get their sample because the first time they sampled, uh, they sampled just beyond that culvert, and that culvert there signals the beginning of Little Marsh Fork. Uh, so it, you know, Brushy Fork is so small that they actually missed it. Uh, but I digress. Uh, what they did was instead of going to the spillway and collecting a sample from the effluent, they actually went and got in-stream samples. And they came twice. Uh, once they came for four days, and that was when they actually missed Brushy Fork. So then they had to come back a second time, and they sampled for six days in a row. And the sampling that they had, uh, uh, there was a bit of a conflict in the split samples that we took, but uh, we're not going to talk about that today. They came back and they had something like 5.5 to 6 parts per billion, which would be just above the chronic standard. Um, so then it's, uh, it's up to Judge Chambers in the Southern District of West Virginia's Huntington Division, uh, the federal district court to decide whether or not MARFOR can be held liable for exceeding the water quality standards where it's otherwise in compliance with the effluent limits in its permit. Uh, now, we, uh, again, recall we argue that we have a permit shield. Um, and there's a long line of case law saying that compliance with the effluent limits in your permit or compliance with the permit uh, shields you from this type of enforcement action. And, here we got another Captain America reference with the shield, and this slide might be a bit of a spoiler for uh, those who don't know the outcome. Now, central to the argument over the applicability of the permit shield was a law passed in 2012, in a 2012 session, Senate Bill 615. DEP and the legislature, as I mentioned earlier, this is 
this was not something that was first brought to everyone's attention uh, with the filing of the lawsuit against Marfork. Uh, the EP and the legislature had been aware of the issue with Section 5.1F uh, for some time. DEP did not take the position that 5.1F incorporated every single water quality standard by reference as a condition of every coal NPDES permit. So Senate Bill 615 was passed to clarify that compliance with effluent limits is compliance with the permit. And this is the preamble to the bill. And I think you look at this language right here, I think uh, the preamble is very clear on that point, stating that compliance with the effluent limits contained in an NPDES permit is deemed compliant with the Act. Now, to me, that's very clear language, uh, sort of reinforcing uh, what's you know, historically understood uh, as the applicability of the permit shield to shield you when you're in, in, in compliance with your effluent limits from enforcement action. However, the body of the bill didn't have the same language as the preamble. It states that compliance with the permit is compliance with the Act. And so that's not quite the same thing as the preamble because, you know, OBEC is arguing that we are not, in fact, in compliance with the permit because our permit requires compliance with the water quality standard. So that preamble language was a little bit better because it, I think, was clearer that when we're talking about compliance, we're talking about compliance with effluent limits, and that's compliance. Saying that you're complying with the permit is maybe not as strong because uh, OVEC is arguing that, you know, compliance with the permit means compliance with the water quality standard. So in deciding the issue, Judge Chambers framed the question as whether or not Section 5.1F as a permit condition requires permit holders not to cause a violation of water quality standards, even for pollutants that are not embodied in specific limitations. So first, he tackles the import of Senate Bill 615. And you know, we've got this great language in the preamble that we believe clarifies the legislature's intent. So maybe the body's not quite as clear. Maybe there's a little bit of inconsistency. But look, look at the preamble to see what the legislature meant to do. Judge Chambers says, OK, well, you know, we can look at the preamble in certain instances to discern legislative intent. Um, but he finds that the body is sort of so internally inconsistent that the preamble doesn't shed any light on the inconsistency. So he just sort of kicks the preamble out. So next, the court looks to the language of the bill itself, and it finds it ambiguous. And now where there's ambiguity, uh, ambiguity, uh, you know, a common sort of uh, means of statutory construction is where a court is reviewing a statute and it finds it ambiguous, it will generally uh, give some deference to reasonable agency interpretations. Okay? But you know, DEP also uh, proposed a rule change to the NPDES rules as a companion to Senate Bill 615. And the proposed change to Section 5.1F, Judge Chambers, it, it sort of tracked the language that's in the body of the bill, and Judge Chambers found that to be ambiguous as well. So next, the court looks at DEP's official statement. The EP issued a number of letters about, uh, uh, you know, the ability to enforce water quality standards. We got a, a letter or two by Tom Clark and a few by Kristen Boggs in response to EPA inquiries over the meaning of Senate Bill 615. Now, Judge Chambers found that the letters to EPA didn't really answer the question at hand. He found that they suffered from kind of the same circular sort of reasoning and the same defect as the bill itself. And we got a letter from Tom Clark, though, from 2012 sent to OBEC's counsel, OBEC's attorney, and it's pretty clear in stating that the permit shield prevents enforcement action against the permit holder for a violation of water quality standards where those water quality standards are not boiled down to effluent limitations uh, expressed, you know, as end of pipe uh, fluid limitations in the NPDES permit. Unfortunately, there's a subsequent administrative enforcement action uh, in this case, uh, the case referenced in the letter there, the 2012 letter, where DEP uh, actually did sort of try to seek penalties for violations of the water quality standards, which is kind of somewhat contradictory to the stated position, but 
I don't think Judge Chambers really found that determinative. He, he sort of mentions it. But ultimately, he just sort of discarded out of hand the position articulated by DEP and simply said it was unreasonable. So after blowing through DEP's statements and the, the preamble to Senate Bill 615, uh, which you would think, uh, you know, the preamble is kind of what best encapsulates the legislature's intent, Judge Chambers simply decides that he can determine what the legislature intended. Um, so he concludes that the permit shield only authorizes Marfork to discharge selenium to the extent that it doesn't cause a violation of the water quality standards. Now, uh, water quality-based effluent limits uh, are set as a monthly average at 4.7 for selenium, so given that if you know, we'd have had affluent limits, they'd have likely been, you know, monthly average of 4.7, the water quality standard is 5, you know, uh, there's really not any kind of permit shield at all effectively. Effectively, you've still got to basically be meeting those water quality-based affluent limits, even if your permit doesn't explicitly require it. So here we've got Sad Cap in America sitting next to his broken shield, and, you know, the import of the uh, August 22nd, 2013 decision is basically that if you hold a coal NPDES permit, um, you don't really have, you know, much of uh, a shield, a Clean Water Act shield from enforcement action, even if you're in compliance with your uh, specific end-of-pipe affluent limitations, even if you complied with all the pre-permitting NPDES disclosure requirements, uh, the citizens can still enforce the water quality standard, standards despite, uh, you know, kind of a long line of cases to the contrary. And sort of, uh, you know, the fallout from this decision is, uh, you know, Marfork dealt with a, a situation where there were no limits. And uh, on March 31st, 2014, in another case, Obeck versus Alex et al., Judge Chambers took it one step further and said, even if you have report-only limits, uh, meaning if your NPDES permit simply requires you to monitor and report your selenium levels, then you could still be held liable for violating the water quality standards. And, and you know, that seems to be a bit of a conflict because, you know, your affluent limits and the permit that DEP gives you, they say all you've got to do is report. Uh, so seemingly, you wouldn't have to treat if all DEP is asking to do is report. But pursuant to Judge Chambers' ruling, Report only, it doesn't actually mean report only. You've also got to be hitting water quality standards as well. And so pursuant to that decision, the only way you're going to be, uh, I don't know if shield is the right word, but the only way you're going to be deemed to be in compliance uh, is if DEP issues a compliance schedule whereby compliance is, you know, Judge Chambers ruled that DEP does have the authority to temporarily suspend compliance with the water quality standards. So if DEP finds a reasonable potential in a reissuance uh, of a permit for the uh, exceedance of the water quality standard, it can issue uh, maybe a 27-month compliance schedule with construction milestones to allow you to construct treatment. And as long as it's just a temporary suspension, Judge Chambers says that uh, that's fine. You don't have to meet water quality standards. Then. So that's uh, the limited circumstance after this decision where you might be shielded from enforcement action. And, and that sort of sums up where we ended up with the uh, numeric standard, uh, you know, and, and in terms of the permit shield. Now we're going to shift gears and talk about OVAC v. Elk Run. And this is the case that dealt with the narrative water quality standard. And since we're going to be talking a little bit about bugs, I'm abandoning the Captain America references in favor of uh, Starship Troopers references. And for those of you who haven't seen it, Starship Troopers, uh, basically about people in space battling giant murderous bugs. Um, OBEC brought suit against Elk Run uh, for discharges uh, resulting in high conductivity levels near streams and its uh, mines, a couple different mines in Boone County. And uh, this is just uh, satellite imagery of uh, Elk Run's operations down in Boone County, just to give you an idea of where it's located. Uh, it, also named in the complaint was Alex Energy uh, for discharges associated with conductivity from its Nicholas Energy mines associated with its Nicholas Energy complex uh, down mostly in Nicholas County, but you see it straddles the line there with Clay County as well. 
So uh, OVEC says, okay, so we can sue for violation of any permit condition, and including a condition to comply with the water quality standard. Now we just talked about the numeric standards in selenium, and the next case is going to address, you know, the Elk Run case addresses the narrative standards uh, and the idea that coal NPDES permits prohibit discharges that cause or contribute to biological impairment. And uh, there's a picture of an ion there. Uh, so biological impairment and uh, due to ionic impairment. So first we look at West Virginia's narrative water quality standard. Now the relevant portion says uh, that discharges can't cause biological impairment. Okay? And that sounds uh, kind of broad, kind of vague. How do we assess biological impairment in West Virginia? Primarily through the West Virginia Stream Condition Index. Uh, a lot of permits now are requiring whole effluent toxicity testing, wet testing, but uh, we're going to stick mostly to the West Virginia Stream Condition Index, or WIVSKI, today. WIVSKI uh, purports to assess a stream's biological condition by collecting benthic macroinvertebrate samples. And those are basically bugs, uh, bugs that spend uh, some portion of their life in a stream bed. And so you collect the bugs from small areas of the stream and you evaluate the stream's physical habitat as well. Now the results of these bug samples, uh, you look at sort of the bug makeup, uh, the diversity of the bugs you have, and also you look at the habitat assessments. And these combine to form an overall score. And this score compares the biological integrity of the stream you're looking at uh, to streams throughout the state, uh, reference streams. And the reference stream, streams are thought of, you know, as being streams that are not at all or at least minimally impacted sort of by development or industry. Uh, reference streams are, are thought of as, you know, being pristine or sort of in the ideal condition. If uh, ideally all streams would look like the reference streams. And the Wiski score compares the diversity of the bugs and the feeding groups represented uh, you know, it looks at the bug population of your stream and compares it to the reference stream. And in looking at bug diversity, there's an emphasis on having pollutant intolerant bugs represented, like the mayfly. You got a picture up there of the mayfly. Um, and so you can have a lot of bugs uh, in your bug sample, but you can still get a low whiskey score, uh, with the theory being that your stream is biologically impaired if the weak bugs aren't present. And so Wiski sort of seeks to thwart, you know, the process of natural selection, as alluded to by the cat cartoon. Uh, if the cat can evolve to sort of mutate its hand into a can opener, uh, mayflies should be able to evolve to handle a little bit of, of uh, increased ionic uh, action in their water. Uh, this is just a photo of somebody performing a kick neck test, and just to give you an idea of how you sort of go about uh, getting your whiskey score. Uh, kick net test, you jump in the stream with a net, you disturb the stream bed with your foot to, to basically kick up uh, bugs. And you take the bugs, you collect back to the lab in a jar, you count them up, and uh, you, you compare your bugs to the reference stream bugs uh, to get your whiskey score. So if that's how we measure biological impairment, um, it would seem fairly difficult to establish that you know, a particular discharge is responsible, uh, given that there are factors such as you know, the stream habitat uh, that can, you know, there are factors other than water chemistry that can affect uh, biological impairment. You know? And then stream habitat, well, you know, one example is tree cover for streams. Um, there are different feeding groups that I've sort of mentioned in passing uh, of bugs, and you know, one of them is uh, shredders. And shredders uh, kind of dine on leaves. And so uh, if you don't have a lot of tree cover for your stream, you don't have leaves falling in, uh, then you might not have a lot of uh, bugs from the shredder group. But that doesn't have anything necessarily. That doesn't mean that you've got bad water chemistry. So how do you go about, through an NPDES permit or a Clean Water Act enforcement action, challenging uh, compliance with the biological, uh, the narrative biological standard? Well, not to worry, EPA has released benchmarks for conductivity. EPA believes it has sufficient scientific evidence that conductivity levels above the 3 to 500 level are correlated with biological impairment. Now, for those unfamiliar with the term conductivity, it's 
is, as it sounds, it's a measure of the ability of water to pass an electrical current. Uh, it's, it's not conductivity itself is not a pollutant. It's simply uh, it's a, it, it simply you know looks at the ability of water to uh, conduct ele an electrical current, and that's impacted by the presence of dissolved solids, uh, chloride, nitrate, sulfate, uh, sodium, magnesium, calcium, uh, and, and sort of looks at the uh, the ions uh, in the water. And the basic unit of measurement is microsiemens per centimeter. Here's a picture of a conductivity meter, and many members in the environmentalist groups that we deal with, they get training on how to use these, and they go around uh, near mines, surface mines around the state, and they take these and they sample looking for high conductivity. So EPA has released its benchmark uh, saying that it thinks that three to 500 is the score where you're going to see some biological impairment. And so Using uh, the WISCI, uh, West Virginia's uh, sort of measuring tool for biological impairment, uh, a failing score is a 60.8. And from a 60.8 up to a 68 is kind of a gray area, but you know, DEP says if you've got below a 60.8, that's a failing score. And DEP has been, uh, you know, they have a lot of data uh, looking at WISCI scores and streams around the state. And they have the corresponding conductivity levels, too. So in looking at this chart here that takes some, plots some of the whiskey scores and the corresponding conductivity levels, if you draw a vertical line uh, at EPA's benchmark of 500 and a horizontal line at 60.8, which is what the EPA considers to be a failing whiskey score, you see that if EPA is right, uh, we shouldn't have any of these data points here in the yellow box. Every Wipsky score with a corresponding conductivity level over 500 should be a failing score. And yet, we've got plenty of Wipsky scores well over 70 with conductivity well over 500. So, you know, EPA might claim that there's some sort of scientific uh, consensus, you know, that, that the science is settled, as we hear with global warming all the time. But uh, the data demonstrates that there is simply not a direct correlation between conductivity over 500 and biological impairment. So, OVEC versus Elkron is a lot about whose interpretation, uh, you know, as, as far as the correlation between conductivity and biological impairment the court should accept. Should it accept uh, DEP's view, which I think is the more nuanced position that you got to take a holistic approach to biological impairment. Um, you know, being that DEP has primacy over the state's water program, and they're the ones who actually wrote the narrative standard, or do we accept EPA's uh, benchmark, which is demonstrably wrong? And I think it can be grossly oversimplified as, you know, asking, uh, is a surface mine operator in violation of its NPDES permit every time you can't find mayflies in a stream near its mine? So uh, with that, uh, we go to trial on Elk Run, uh, and plaintiff's expert says that she's absolutely certain that it's Elk Run and Alex's discharges that are uh, associated with conductivity that are causing the biological impairment. And, you know, is there any evidence to the contrary? No, there's none, she says. Well, then she's presented with a lot of same type of data, except uh, a lot of this data, I believe, was collected uh, around 20 Mile Creek area down in Nicholas County uh, by Alex. She's presented with this uh, data where you see highlighted, you've got a lot of conductivity scores well over 500, well over 1,000, up in 2,000, 3,000, and yet you have passing whiskey scores. So uh, when confronted with this evidence, Ms. Palmer says, I can't explain that. So, uh, you know, that you would think uh, that uh, that's kind of uh, how plaintiffs prove their case. They've got to prove a causal link, and they can't prove it. She can't explain the actual evidence. Without a direct correlation between conductivity and failing bug scores, you can't establish that a point source is causing biological impairment. If the conductivity doesn't fit, you must acquit. And also, um, 
not even a week before Judge Chambers issued his opinion. Uh, the West Virginia Supreme Court reviewed basically uh, the same evidence uh, that was presented in the Elk Run trial in the context of, uh, context of an NPS permit appeal on review from the Environmental Quality Board. Our state Supreme Court looked at that evidence, and it found that the scientific evidence did not support requiring DEP to do a reasonable potential analysis every time you have conductivity levels above 500. Essentially, the scientific evidence isn't as uniform and conclusive as plaintiffs and EPA make it out to be regarding a causal link between discharges of conduct associated with conductivity and biological impairment. So again, we look at that, we say, hey, uh, that's a good thing. We should be in pretty good shape. Uh, our, our own state Supreme Court has uh, taken a look at things, and it's you know, rightfully decided to uh, defer to DEP on this issue. And then the opinion comes out. And keeping with our Starship Trooper's theme and sort of the, the battle over bugs, um, Here's a bit of a spoiler alert. Uh, the bugs won. We first argued that you couldn't rule in plaintiff's favor because doing so effectively creates a conductivity water quality based uh, affluent limit. And the DC District Court had previously ruled in 2012 that that was beyond EPA's powers to create essentially an affluent limit for conductivity. Well, Judge Chambers dismissed that argument saying that plaintiffs weren't seeking to enforce a strict conductivity limit established by EPA. Rather, they're just using EPA's documents as evidence supporting a causal link between conductivity and the biologically impaired streams around the mine. So, you know, that seems like too fine of a distinction to make, but, you know, that's, that's what Judge Chambers decided. Uh, next, he decides that there's no basis to defer to DEP or the West Virginia legislature's interpretation of the biological impairment because of the allegedly extensive science supporting causation. So instead, uh, he defers the EPA's benchmark. And, uh, you know, to add insult to injury, he doesn't, he, you know, he dismisses EPA, or not EPA, DEP's, uh, DEP's belief that uh, a failing bug score, a whiskey score, is 60.8, and instead he raises it to 68 as the impairment threshold. And, you know, pretty much the overall impression that you get from reading the opinion is that if you've got conductivity above 500 and you don't have any mayflies in your stream, you're vulnerable to enforcement of the narrative standard for biological impairment. So again, uh, permit shield already broken uh, for the numeric standard. Now we have it that you have to also worry about the narrative standard, uh, which seemingly is uh, sort of too vague and broad to directly enforce in a citizen suit and was certainly never intended to be directly enforced in a citizen suit, but using EPA's benchmark, now uh, plaintiffs can go out, look at conductivity levels, and any time, you know, regardless of what the cause may be, you have uh, any kind of biological impairment, you're vulnerable. So looking at the future, um, I think the fix is a uh, modification to Section 5.1F. DEP has proposed a modification to 5.1F, and you see here, um, basically the fix simply deletes the offending portion of 5.1F. This was publicly advertised, or public notice was issued on, I think, June 24, 2014. Public hearing was held on June, July 24, 2014, and Jason Bostic of the West Virginia Coal Association was there doing the Lord's work and speaking in favor of the revision. So, you know, I'm a little biased uh, because uh, this is kind of what I do a lot, but uh, I think this modification is probably one of the single most important actions uh, to the coal industry, anyway, that the legislature could take this session. And I, I, I think everybody would agree that it's uh, pretty imperative that this thing gets passed. Looking even further into the future, um, Looking even further into the future, um, I think what we're going to anticipate is uh, if this fix gets passed, there might be some arguments uh, that, uh, you know, OBEC might argue that even the legislative fix is not going to help current permit holders because Section 4020 of the Clean Water Act contains an anti-backsliding provision. That it, and, and what the anti-backsliding provision does is it prohibits relaxing uh, water quality-based effluent limits 
beyond the limits established in the previous permit. But there are also a number of exceptions to the anti-backsliding rule uh, contained in Section 402.02, uh, notably one for mistaken interpretations of the law at the time the permit was issued. Um, I think there were clearly uh, mistakes in interpreting 5.1F along the way. Uh, I think it's pretty clear DEP never anticipated that 5.1F would be used to allow citizens to directly enforce West Virginia's water quality standards. So we're going to be looking at that as well as other arguments um, if and when the time comes in the future to address that. Uh, but hopefully, first of all, uh, we can get this fix passed um, because I think that's uh, really important uh, so that uh, you know the coal industry can be confident that when DEP gives it an NPDES permit, as long as it complies with that NPDES permit, that it's okay. You know. Um, and uh, with that, I think it's time is about 12.50, so I'll, uh, I'll open it up to any questions, if we received any questions. And we have one question. Um, Bill Goodfellow, I will reach out to you. Uh, to uh, discuss your question. Um, I'll reach out to you via email. But uh, that, I think, is the only question that we have submitted. Um, so with that, I suppose uh, I will uh, wrap it up and, and turn it back over to uh, Madison. All right. Thank you all for participating. We hope you'll join us again in the future. To exit the webinar, simply click the exit button.